when it's action you want. You want America's Superstation. WGN Superstation. There's been a break in the case of murdered cab driver Kuhir Kurashi. Chicago police have arrested two teenage cousins. Tonight, both are charged as adults with first-degree murder. Good evening. I'm Randy Salerno. And I'm Dina Bear. Steve and Allison are off tonight. Here's what's new at 9 o'clock. Police say the teens were charged today after officers took them into custody last night. The 33-year-old cabbie was shot Saturday while walking to his car on West Arthur Avenue in the Rogers Park neighborhood. WGN's Dana Kozlov is live at Area 3 Police Headquarters with details. Dana. Good evening, Dana. Area 3 Police Lieutenant Michael Chasen says the 16- and 15-year-old cousins both gave written statements to police about the incident with their parents present. He says neither had been in trouble before. It's the first offense for both, and that offense is allegedly first-degree murder. 33-year-old Zahiruddin Qureshi started his Saturday like he began many others, walking to his cab. Minutes later, police say he was approached by three teenagers looking for money. Two of them, 15- and 16-year-old cousins, are now charged with shooting Qureshi when he resisted. They got nothing. They got nothing. The victim uh, fought back, and it was due to his, uh, they felt it, you know, when he fought back, that's why he was shot, and then they fled, they took nothing from him. Lieutenant Chasen says a witness led detectives to a third 14-year-old cousin who helped lead investigators to the suspects. He was not charged with the crime. Chasen says the 15-year-old suspect had been visiting his 16-year-old cousin at the time of Kwashi's shooting and says the boys were decent students who had never been in trouble before. All I know is, is they, they, they availed themselves to a gun. And because they had the gun, this, there's a man that's dead. A day after Quarshi's murder, fellow cab drivers held a protest against the city's ban on cabs parking on residential streets. They felt that had contributed to Quarshi's death. But Lieutenant Chasen says in this case, Quarshi was truly a victim of circumstance. The cab that he was going to was nowhere in sight. He was, he was any other citizen walking down the alley. The fact that he was a cab driver played no part in this, in this crime. Lieutenant Chasen says an acquaintance in the 15-year-old Southside neighborhood gave him the gun. Beyond that, the Lieutenant Chasen doesn't know where the weapon came from. Both cousins are expected to be in bond court tomorrow. We're live outside Area 3 Police Headquarters. Dana Kozlov, WGN News. All right, thank you, Dana. All is cleared up tonight after a gas leak wreaked havoc downtown this evening. It happened just before 4 o'clock this evening at Columbus Drive and Randolph. Traffic had to be diverted from the area. This after construction workers accidentally cracked the two-inch medium pressure pipe. Emergency crews from People's Gas capped the leak, but not before some fumes got into the Blue Cross Blue Shield building. 2,000 employees were evacuated. It was a private contract. A third party struck our facility, and it's our job then to make sure that the area is safe and that service is restored in as reliable and safe fashion as possible, and that's what we're working at right now. Officials say a construction company contracted with the city to move a Department of Streets and Sanitation yard from Lower Wacker to Randolph. There were no injuries. The mother of a Northwestern University football player who died during a preseason workout earlier this month filed a wrongful death lawsuit today. Rashidi Wheeler collapsed on the practice field after he had an asthma attack on August 3rd. He later died. Today, Wheeler's mother filed the lawsuit, which names Northwestern University and seven athletic department officials. Northwestern University tonight is responding, quote, Obviously, we are disappointed by this action, but it does not alter the university's sympathy for Rashidi's family for their loss. It is our hope that by working in conjunction with the NCAA, medical experts, and other appropriate groups, we can help ensure that tragic accidents such as this do not occur again. Visitation services are concluding this evening for the Chicago police officer killed in the line of duty Sunday night. Earlier today, fellow officers assembled at the scene where 37-year-old Eric Lee, an Englewood District tactical officer, was shot in an alley near 63rd and Aberdeen. He was eulogized by many, including 16th Ward Alderman Shirley Coleman, who said police and those who live in the area must do more together to improve conditions in Englewood. Two men have already been arrested in Lee's killing. Tomorrow, funeral services will be held for the slain officer. They are at the Salem Baptist Church on South Indiana Avenue. They start at 11 o'clock a.m. Lee will be laid to rest at Oakwood Cemetery following that church service. 
Mourners gathered in Skokie tonight to remember, remember Michael Messer, the assistant U.S. attorney shot to death in South Carolina. Tonight's memorial service through relatives, friends, co-workers, and U.S. attorney John Ashcroft. Messer and his colleague Gillum Ferguson were shot during a robbery attempt in South Carolina Monday. Ferguson was struck in the arm, but Messer of Morton Grove was shot in the back and died. Four teenagers have been charged with that murder. Parents of students at one Northwest Suburban School want to know how the possibility of mold in the school will affect their children. The start of school was already delayed at Woodland Elementary in Carpentersville, and tonight parents are meeting with administrators in hopes of getting some answers. WGN's Julian Cruz joins us live from Barrington Middle School Station campus with the latest. Julian? Good evening, Randy. A lot could change on Monday when results are expected back on Woodland Elementary, which was tested for the possibility of mold. Tonight's meeting was held to present both an interim and a long-term plan to parents, which basically calls for moving kids around to other area schools until more is known on the mold situation. But many angry parents that we talk to say this entire situation never should have happened to begin with. The district superintendent appealed to the crowd for calm, but it didn't take long for parents to voice their frustration and anger. You people have the right to say to me that Woodland School, this dump in Carpentersville, is going to house my child at eight years old. The so-called dump this parent is referring to is Woodland Elementary School in Carpentersville. Many parents feel regardless of the test results for mold, the school is unfit for their kids. Another parent points to what she says is a history of roof and water problems. The inspection conducted on August 16th by the King County and State Health Department states that the facility has shown historic water intrusion and musty odors throughout the building. Because no one knows what the test results will bring on Monday, uh, the school officials uh, here, the District uh, 220, Barrington officials, had to come up with both an interim and a long-term plan. They are complicated. The long-term plan won't be decided on until next week, depending on the mold. But the interim plan uh, calls in part for moving some of the students to Barrington High School. They will be bused there, which uh, many parents uh, were not happy with, but they are making arrangements now uh, to house the kids in a special area there and to make other accommodations so they are not uh, mixing and walking through the hallways with the high school kids and uh, some of the other children would be sent to Sunny Hill School uh, but a full school board meeting is scheduled for next week and that's where many parents are expected to air their grievances about this whole situation. Reporting live in Barrington, Julian Cruz, WGN News. Julian, thank you. Governor George Ryan saying tonight that he may not make a decision on O'Hare expansion by the September 1st deadline. Federal lawmakers have threatened to intervene if Ryan doesn't respond to Mayor Daley's $6 billion plan by then. At an unrelated press conference, Ryan said he did not feel bound by the date. I think it's an artificial deadline of September 1st. Uh, I'm going to take the time I need to, to make the proposal that I need to make, and that'll be as soon as I can get it done. The governor brushed off reporters when questioned about his 1998 pledge against new runways at O'Hare. So far, Ryan has had three public hearings on the mayor's proposal. The last hearing is set for next Monday night in Tinley Park. Still no decision in the corruption trial of Calumet City Mayor Jerry Genova and former Public Works Commissioner Jerome Stack. The jury adjourned until tomorrow after more than six hours of deliberations. It had earlier asked the court to clarify the difference between official misconduct and bribery. U.S. District Court Judge Ruben Castillo referred them to the list of jury instructions. Castillo has not ruled on a third defendant who was tried earlier. Some of their friends call them superheroes tonight. Two Arlington Heights men who captured an armed robbery suspect then sat on him until police arrived. The 18-year-old alleged robber held up a convenience store in the northwest suburb, but before he could get away, two would-be heroes chased him down. Nick Rebus, transmission specialist by day, crime fighter yesterday. Rebus walked across the street from Arlington Transmission to get a bag of chips Wednesday afternoon. While he was inside the Convenient Plus food store, he realized there was no clerk behind the counter. But then he saw this man, 18-year-old Kenneth Thompson, and the clerk with blood around his neck. And he came running around me, flew out the door, I chased him a block and a half away. And I tackled him, got him down, and held him there for about 15 minutes. Rebus says he and another man, Andy Derry, sat on top of the 6-foot, 5-inch, 
275-pound Thompson until police arrived. What's the guy saying while you're sitting on him? He's like, oh, I got, I got asthma. I was like, well, you should have thought of that before you ran from me, you know? Police say Thompson, a first-time offender, had slashed the clerk with a utility knife and made off with all the money in the drawer, as well as a couple cartons of cigarettes. Thanks to Rebus, the transmission specialist, and Derry, the car mechanic, Thompson didn't get very far. It was a, it was a great piece of work that they did. Uh, it's something we certainly don't encourage, but everything worked out for the best on this one. What happens if these guys don't step in and do this? We may still be looking for this offender today. Thompson is charged with armed robbery and aggravated battery. He's being held on $150,000 bond. The clerk was treated for his injuries and released. Oh, this is a God help, you know, it was came on time. And they are, they are very brave and then help us, you know, catch, catching that uh, the guy, you know. Are you a hero? In my eyes, I see, uh, because nobody got hurt. Nobody got killed out of the deal, you know, and everybody was all right, including the guy that we took to the ground. Would you do it again? Yeah, if I had to. So be careful in early tonight. Police do call Rebus and Derry heroes, and the village is expected to give them citizens commendations for their crime-fighting work. All he needs now is a cape. Yep. The man wanted in a West Coast killing spree of his own family members is now on the FBI's most wanted list. Just ahead on WG News, an update on why investigators believe they're having so much trouble catching up with this man. And on the Medical Watch, carbonated beverages with caffeine may be bad for your bones. The story later on. Plus, sightseers get an eyeful in New York as a paraglider pilot is liberated from a famous statue. I'm Tom Skilling. We have fog in the forecast in parts of the area later tonight. This humid air mass may go on to produce weekend rains here. And speaking of rains, they're swimming out in the Quincy area. Over eight inches of rain down in the last uh, 36 to 48 hours. It's over now, but more may be headed there too. We'll check this one of this last weekends of summer and the prospects for rain later, so stay with us. You're watching Chicago's very own WGN News. With Allison Payne, Steve Sanders, Tom Skilling, and Dan Rome. This is WGN News at 9. The man wanted in this week's killing rampage in Sacramento, California, may have enough money to help him evade capture. That's the latest word from police in their nationwide manhunt for Nikolai Soltis. The 27-year-old Ukrainian immigrant has been placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, and a $70,000 reward has been issued for information leading to his arrest. Police say he stabbed to death his pregnant wife, three-year-old son, and four other relatives during Monday's murder spree in suburban Sacramento. Investigators say Soltis may be carrying up to $15,000 in cash, most of which was extorted from members of his community. Police say they believe he may still be in Sacramento. President Bush is defending his across-the-board tax cuts tonight. Bush spoke with students at a Texas elementary school today. Yesterday, the White House released numbers showing a sharp drop in the budget surplus, and some Democrats say Bush's tax cut is to blame. But the president says America needs a tax cut to boost the sluggish economy. The country is in an economic slowdown. And so what a president should ask and what the Congress should ask is, what can we do to stimulate economic growth? And we responded with tax relief. Now, evidently, there's some people in Washington, D.C. who are having second thoughts about tax relief. And so my question to them was, do they want to raise taxes? Mr. Bush will continue his working vacation until Congress reconvenes after Labor Day. Israeli tanks tonight have moved into a Palestinian neighborhood in the West Bank. Fifteen Palestinians and four soldiers were injured when Israel took over Hebron after two young Israeli brothers were shot there. Earlier today, Israel fired missiles at a Palestinian militant while he was driving in the West Bank. The missiles hit the car, but the man escaped with minor injuries. Israeli officials say he was responsible for several attacks against Israeli citizens. Four others were injured in the blast. And in the Gaza Strip, an 11-year-old Palestinian boy was shot and killed during a clash between Israel, Israeli troops and Palestinian citizens. A bus and a car collide in Turkey. Twelve people are dead, including a baby. Authorities say... The bus hit a car on a country road and then rolled down an embankment. Rescuers had to use construction equipment to bring up the bus. Ambulances transported at least 36 other injured to area hospitals. No word yet on why the bus hit that car. A judge has placed a former commanding officer with the Illinois Air National Guard on three years probation for hiding a camera in the women's bathroom on the military side of O'Hare International Airport. 
Mark Lynn told officials he placed the closed circuit camera in the bathroom in 1996. It fed a live picture and sound to a monitor in his office. But Lynn said he never observed anyone because of poor reception. He's been fined $2,500 in order to perform 100 hours of community service. The FBI and Chicago police are still searching for two men who robbed a far southeast side bank inside a jewel supermarket. On Tuesday, the men stole an unknown amount of cash from the TCF bank at 3940 East 106th Street. Today, police released still photos from the surveillance tape. Authorities say one suspect demanded cash from a teller while the other stood guard. After getting the cash, they took off in a black mid-sized car. A guilty conscience may have gotten to another bank robber. On Monday, Sean Ferrison allegedly stole $43,000 from the Parkway Bank and Trust in Streamwood. The next day, he walked into the DuPage County Sheriff's Office and confessed. On him, the pellet gun he used for the robbery and $15,000. No word yet on what happened to the remaining money. Ferrison is being held without bond. New type of barrier could make living and working by the L tracks a little less noisy. The first acoustical tube in the country is being built on the Green Line between 31st and 33rd Streets along State Street. The 50-foot tall steel and cement tube will enclose the tracks on the Illinois Institute of Technology's main campus and muffle the noise produced by the trains that run throughout it. The completion is set for next spring. A warning is going out to pet owners in two Chicago suburbs. Make sure your pets have up-to-date rabies shots. The warnings were issued after the discovery of rabid bats. The first bat was found alive in Mount Prospect on August 15th after it bit someone. The second was found dead Monday outside a home in Orland Park. But animal control workers say it doesn't appear it had contact with any animals or humans. It's a key parcel of land adjacent to Wrigley Field, which the Cubs want to use for a new parking garage and retail development. The Cubs say the land belongs to them, but Chicago officials say that's not the case. That's one of tomorrow's headlines tonight in the Chicago Tribune. The land in question is just west of the park, now occupied by a parking lot. The Tribune company, which owns the Cubs, says it bought the land from a bankrupt railroad in 1982. The city attorney said today the land wasn't the railroad's property. They say it's been city property since the 19th century. The city attorneys say the Cubs have to negotiate with them for the land. There's more controversy surrounding the dietary supplement ephedrine. Traces of the NCAA banned substance were found in Rashidi Wheeler's system by the Cook County Medical Examiner, even though the medical examiner said it didn't play a role in his death. Now college... Drug testing experts are saying athletes are rarely tested for the supplement, even though it's illegal. They say it's simply too expensive to test athletes for ephedrine. A Cook County judge has ruled that election ballots can be screened at polling places for mistakes. Those mistakes include failing to vote in some races or voting for too many candidates in a race. Ballot screening is already allowed in some area municipal elections. Those are some of tomorrow's headlines tonight. You can read more on Friday's Chicago Tribune or online at chicagotribune.com. Only in New York, a French stuntman had a plan to fly to the torch on the Statue of Liberty and bungee jump his way down. Well, troubles he had, trouble with the landing when his motorized parachute got stuck. Police officers worked for half an hour to free him. Officials closed the monument temporarily and evacuated Liberty Island for fears of a possible terrorist assault. Mayor Rudy Giuliani was not amused. So there may be some humor about this, but I don't find it very funny. Not when police officers' lives are put in jeopardy by an idiot like this. Or whatever, but that was... Tonight, stuntman Terry DeVoe faces various charges, including trespassing and disorderly conduct. In 1994, he was also arrested after hiding in the statue. Today's rescuing officers say he didn't even thank them. Did you buy your Powerball lottery ticket yet? Well, I wish. Just ahead, Tribune columnist Bob Green has some thoughts about big lottery jackpots and the big dreams that come with them. But first, here's a look at today's winning midday numbers. Tonight's Illinois Lottery drawing is next. Here's an invitation to all you whistleblowers out there. If you've got a tip for the WGN News Investigative Unit, call us toll-free at 1-866-TIP-9. That's 866-847-6463. Or email us at tip9 at WGNTV.com. All calls and correspondence are confidential.
It's a dream now worth nearly $300 million. Only most people are awake when they're dreaming about this one, right? It's Saturday night's drawing of the multi-state Powerball lottery because no one won the jackpot last night. At $280 million now, it's the second highest Powerball jackpot. The largest was $295 million. And why the fever when a lottery jackpot gets so big? even though the chances are so very, very small. Chicago Tribune columnist Bob Green has some thoughts on all this. You know, Bob, somehow I just can't see you standing in line, buying a ticket, and then writing down what you would do with the millions. But is this such a bad thing? Uh, well, you, what it makes you think about is were the governments, both federal and local, for all those centuries who told the citizens it's wrong to gamble, gambling's bad, the government will outlaw it, we will crack the numbers rackets and put it on page one, we'll send the vice squad out, were they wrong for two centuries and then got smart? Or are they really just sort of given up now and saying, you know, we are bankrupt of ideas about how to raise money in legitimate, honest ways. We're going to go into the gambling business and we're going to be the numbers runner. Well, wasn't the Revolutionary War or Washington's uh, trip across the Potomac or something funded with lottery proceeds? Is that true? I think so, I think yes. you got a scoop there. I don't well, know. I've heard it. No, but read a different history book than we no, did. No, check it out. Yeah, and you can't, I mean, you can't blame people for putting their money into the lottery pot. On the other hand, it really is a sucker tax, and we have seen year after year, it's now becoming generation after generation, that the people who are the very least able to afford it are the ones who throw their money after this dream. And does the government have a right to do this? Yes, they voted themselves to have that right. Is it right to do that? Is it right to, in effect, exploit the people with these kind of dreams? I'm There's not sure. A good PR blitz now, they always say the money goes to a good cause, education and other such well, things. That, that was always the idea, but for centuries in this country, they were able to fund education without, I mean, you know, you had Elliot Ness trying to break up the rackets. Now Elliot Ness would be running the racket. So is it such a bad thing, though, for people to have a little fun here, throw a dollar or two down? It's, I mean... it's, it's not the end of the world, but it also sends sort of a weird message, which is, again, all through history, the country has tried to say, if you want to advance, do so through hard work and diligence and all those verities. Now, I was, I was in this little town in Nebraska, and I was walking down the street, and there was this mansion. And I asked someone, is this the bank president? Is this the owner of the local you know, grocery chain? He said, no, that's the lady who won the lottery. Now, that's not the end of the world. And to take it totally around in the circle, is the stock market so much different? But that story that you told right there is why we all buy those tickets. Well, except when we, when we say, you know, now the lotteries, the reason the numbers are up so big is the lotteries are feeling the heat from the casinos. Because one thing led to another, and now the lotteries are seeming a little bit boring unless they get up into these huge numbers because now the states have you know, got their finger in the casino game. So it just sort of escalates, and we keep telling ourselves there's nothing wrong with it. It's just fun. But maybe once in a while we should step back and not be critical of the people who buy the lottery tickets, but think about the states and wonder how they got to this point after years of saying you can't do this. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. Well, I see it. One less guy I have to beat now to, uh, to win the, uh, the big lottery. Your odds just right. better. Is that what you think? Bob's out. <laughs> Umbrellas went down. Sunglasses came out late this afternoon as sunshine returns. But will the weekend be as nice? Tom Skilling has the complete forecast coming up next. You're watching Chicago's very own WGN News at 9. This is the time of year we call the dog days of summer, but it's been a little on the cooler side lately, although muggy. How long will this weather pattern stick around? The Legion TV meteorologist Tom Skilling can tell us, Tom. Well, Dina and Randy, it's uh, certainly been a, a quite a turn we've made in this summer. We've gotten wet all of a sudden, but I think the rains are out of here for a while. We may get some fog out of this muggy area you were talking about. Dina, starting later tonight and tomorrow, won't be total area fog. I mean, everybody's going to see haze, but the thickest of it will occur more in some areas than others. What is interesting is uh, if it does rain, as we think it will at times at least, tomorrow night and Saturday, this will be the first time this summer that we've put together back-to-back -to -back weekends with rain in Chicago. And interestingly, only a quarter of the weekend days this summer so far uh, have indeed produced measurable precipitation. Well, we had clouds today. Uh, they really wasted uh, quite a bit of time before they cleared out of the area. But finally, as you can see in this time lapse through the day, we did break them open. And tonight we have kind of partly cloudy skies. You watched it in the time lapse as these clouds parted on occasion. This allows some cooling to go on. And with all the moisture in the air, 
And you can see the clouds uh, lingering in spots over the lake, but um, essentially shrinking in aerial coverage. We do think the cooling that goes on tonight will allow mop fog to reform, and we're getting some visibility reduction already. Then uh, the cloud will begin to lift, or the clouds will, and so will the fog, and we ought to have some sunshine, but then cloud over again later tomorrow, and then the cloud cover is getting serious because it could begin to shower and thunderstorm on us after that. This was a tropical storm. It has been sheared apart and now is moving northward. No threat to the United States. And the folks in Quincy out here by the Mississippi River are grateful that the rains have ceased there. Uh, one little town, Brooklyn, has had uh, eight and a half inches of rain in the last 24 hours or had through noon today. That rain is shut down. It's been part of waves of thunderstorms that have developed within this humid air mass and left uh, 209 uh, total severe weather reports over the central United States over the last couple of days, including the wind damage reports we saw here last night. And we had some noisy thunderstorms beyond midnight last night that dropped some additional heavy rain before it all pulled out of here. Dew points are at 69 degrees, so that's the temperature to which your air temperature has got to drop for the humidity to go to 100% and fog to form, essentially. These are the winds a couple days ago. Here they are at noon today and through the afternoon, blowing in from the northeast and with dew points in the 60s and the cooling of the night going on. Look at how close we are to that dew point of 69 now with a 70 degree reading at O'Hare, 71 midway and 72 at the lakefront. We do think fog will form. Relative humidity, kind of a measure of how close we are to that dew point, is up closing in on the 100 percent range right now, 90 to Oh, 85 to 90 percent. Most areas not far from the point at which fog forms and that 100 percent humidity. It's 88 percent at the lakefront. Moderate mold pollen today or mold spores with the pollens moderate down a little bit from the excessive levels of yesterday. Well, weather systems are slow to move. The major jet stream in typical August fashion stays up here. This is where it'll be tomorrow. Here's where it is on Saturday. So a little weather system that...